became a college professor at the best possible time. It was the fall of 2008. It was the year of Obama. There was so much hope and excitement and change and optimism in our world, at least in my world. I had just finished my PhD in sociology and I was embarking upon a career that I knew that I was born to do. A few days before the general election, a new colleague of mine invited me to her house for an election night party. I decided it would be a great opportunity for me to go and to meet new people and to, to meet some colleagues. And so I got to her house that evening a little bit after seven o'clock. And as soon as I opened the door, I received this warm welcome from so many people. Everyone was so nice and friendly. I made my way through the living room and I found a seat uh, next to this older white gentleman and we started talking. I learned that he was a professor just like me. We started chatting about life and work and me being new to the university. Now, I don't know if you all can recall the 2008 election, but the returns came in pretty quickly that night. And it was announced that Barack Obama was elected the 44th president of the United States. Everyone was so excited. People were cheering and celebrating. And me, I just, I couldn't, I was trying so hard to hold back tears. My father was born in 1936 in rural Alabama, and he never would have imagined seeing a black president. My mother, she graduated from high school just a few weeks before the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and I know that she never thought she would envision, envision such a day. But here we were. I was literally in a space and a time where race didn't matter anymore. My new colleague who I had just, was, just met and was talking to, he tapped me on the shoulder, he leaned in, put his finger in my face, and said, no more excuses. Barack Obama is the president now, so you go get your education. You tell your brother, your cousin, tell everyone you know, go get your education. No more excuses. I, I froze. I, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't understand the words that was coming out of his mouth. What was he talking about? No more excuses. I really couldn't do anything. I just grabbed my things. I thanked the hostess for inviting me to the party, got in my car, and I sobbed the whole way home. So I was thinking about the words that he, he, he was talking about to me. I, I thought about what I should do. I decided I wanted to, to, to march myself to his office the next morning and give him an education. I wanted to let him know. I wanted to let him know that I was the third person in just two generations in my family to get a PhD, the second PhD in sociology. I also wanted to let him know that black women, we have been getting educations at the highest rates compared to anyone else in the country. From associate's degrees to doctoral degrees, black women, black women are earning degrees at the highest rates. Now clearly, this gentleman missed the memo about black girl magic, right? <laughs> and I really wish I could have given him a sip of Beyonce's lemonade, <laughs> but I didn't. I, I decided that I, I wouldn't go to his office because that, I'd been down this road many times before. I've experienced this kind of thing before, and I knew how he was going to react. I knew he would say something like that I was probably confused that he was trying to help me, that he was trying to inspire me. He would remind me that he had voted for Obama just like I did. He would even probably suggest that maybe we should sit down at some point and, and chat over coffee. But to be honest with you, I, I, I decided I didn't say anything because I was just, I was too afraid. I, I didn't want to be an angry black woman. So I decided to do nothing and to stay quiet. And I made a decision at that point that I would always stay quiet. And so when colleagues made comments about my changing hairstyles, or when students questioned my legitimacy as their professor in the classroom, I said nothing. I did nothing. 
it would take me five years to find my voice. I watched and grew frustrated at the low numbers of faculty of color at my university. I saw two of my best friends, both African-American professors, leave the university and nothing happened. I grew so frustrated at being an only, the only black person in my department, just a handful of, of black faculty at the university that I decided that I, I just, I needed to get my feelings out. So I, I wrote a journal entry about my experience and it turned into an open letter that was released to the entire faculty community. And that letter went out on Martin Luther King Day of 2014. Coincidentally, it was also the exact same time that I was going up for tenure. <laughs> but I didn't care. I wanted people to know who I was. I wanted people to understand my experiences being marginalized being a token. I wanted to tell everyone how I felt. And the result of that letter was so powerful and so transformative. There were so many discussions on our campus, in small groups and in large groups about race relations and ways in which we could diversify our faculty, things that we could do to improve, and it was so empowering. And I'm happy to report that there are now three people of color in my department. And while that may not seem like a lot, that's three diverse seats at the table. That's really, really important. I'm also now the founding director of the Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnic Relations at my university. And when I think about what happened to me on election night, I wanna share with you all that what happened to me was not unique. Things like this happen to black women all the time. Perhaps you remember the experience of Dr. Tanika Cross. She was on a flight a couple weeks ago heading home to Houston when another passenger needed medical assistance. She raised her hand to help, but the airline attendant told her, no, sit down. They didn't believe she was actually a doctor. These things happen to women of color all the time. Thinking about what happened on election night of 2008, I, I sit back and I think about the tragedy of that evening. And, and to be honest with you, the way I look at it, the tragedy that night was not about what that colleague said to me. To be honest with you, if I saw that man on campus today, I would not know who he was. I don't remember his face, but I certainly remember everything that he said to me. The tragedy that night was how I responded. I allowed a perfect stranger to define me and my career for nearly five years. And if I had to do that over again, I think all the time, what if I stayed that night? What if I stayed back? What if I had tapped into the power of self-definition? Self-definition is something that black feminist scholars have been talking about for decades. It's literally defining who you are on your own terms, even when people in society have a different meaning for you. It's about activating and empowering the voices of black women's experiences, placing them at the center, showing them that they're valuable and they're legitimate. Now, black women have been activating their self-definition for generations. Perhaps you remember Rosa Parks, she exercised self-definition during the Montgomery bus boycotts. The Combahee River Women's Collective, they exercised self-definition in the 1970s when they penned a black feminist manifesto that would become a classic. Three women on the evening of July 13, 2013, following the acquittal of George Zimmerman, they activated the power of self-definition when they created a hashtag that would become the Black Lives Matter movement. An eight-year-old Jacksonville native, Natalie McGriff, she exercised the power of self-definition. She was so tired of being bullied at her school about her beautiful hair that she and her mother created a storybook character, Moxie McGriff. And Moxie is about, she's a superhero, and she teaches little black girls to battle their insecurities. 
She teaches them to exercise their self-definition. And Dr. Tanika Cross, she did that too. She could have very easily gotten off of that flight that night and went home, gone about her business, but she decided to do something different. She shared her story, and that story went viral. When I think about tapping into the power of self-definition, this idea is just so much greater than the experiences of black women. This goes well beyond race relations and gender relations. This is about human difference. If we don't activate and tap into the power of self-definition, what do we miss out on? When you activate self-definition for positive and transformative change, we hold the key to solving some of our most pressing social problems. We must do this, and we must be vulnerable while we're doing it. We need to be unapologetic and standing in who we are, whether that's about race or gender, sexual identities, religion, ethnicity, it doesn't matter. When you tap into the power of self-definition, it's truly, truly transformative. So I tell you to do that today, to tap into the power of self-definition, because it is your responsibility. It is your human right. No more excuses. Thank you.